in the name of Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the Anointed One, the One promised by God. Amen. And the Bible says, And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with pasca. You might remember that a couple of weeks ago we talked about pasca, common drink amongst the Roman people. There at the foot of the cross they had offered Jesus pasca mixed with myrrh. Do you remember that? So that Christ would feel no pain. Now it's important. Pay attention to what happens. One of them ran and filled a sponge with pasca, put it on a reed, a stick, and lifted it up to the mouth of Jesus Christ so that he would drink. But the other said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to rescue him. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant Depart in peace. Remember that one? According to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared me. Why isn't anybody else singing? Why am I the only one? This was my favorite part of the liturgy when I was a little boy, because when we sang this at Zion Lutheran Church, it meant that church was almost over. A good song. Sung by Simeon. Remember when Christ was circumcised, Mary and Joseph had taken Jesus, the little baby Jesus, eight days old, the little tiny baby Jesus. They had taken him to the temple for the covenant of circumcision, and Simeon had waited for 40 years, 40 years there in the temple. He would go every day. He had prayed to God, God, I want to see the Savior. Please, God, hear my prayer. Answer my prayer with my own eyes. I want to see the promised one. And after four decades, Mary and Joseph come into the temple to fulfill the covenant promise that God made with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Remember that? If you don't, read it this afternoon. Genesis chapter 12. And the Holy Spirit comes to Simeon and says, That's the one. See that little baby? See that young couple there? See them going into the temple? That is the Messiah. And Simeon goes over to Mary and Joseph, and with gentleness he takes the baby Jesus out of their arms, and he cradles the infant Savior next to his heart, and he sings this song. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My eyes have seen your salvation. God's promise fulfilled. God, I asked, you answered, I'm ready to die. And note it well. Let your servant depart in peace. I can now die with confidence. I can face the judgment seat of God himself. God, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, I can stand before that judgment seat in peace and with confidence and with joy because I know that now your promise of a Messiah, a Savior, has been fulfilled. I do not have to stand before God on my own. I now have an advocate, a mediator, a savior, someone who will speak to me. This one's mine. This is a believer. This is a follower. This is someone who confessed Christ as savior. Let him in. And through the pearly gates he goes, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. What a great song to sing on your deathbed. Why didn't Jesus sing this song when he was on the cross? 
Why didn't Jesus, when he was suffering and dying there on the cross for the sins of humankind, nailed with those rough iron nails to the rough wood of the cross, bearing the sins of all humanity, and Christ begins to sing from the cross, why didn't he choose this song? Did you know that? I, I didn't realize it until this past week that Christ sang a song from the cross. Did you know that? A couple of weeks ago, I asked you to read Psalm 22. You remember that? And some of you did, and some of you didn't. If you haven't read it, I strongly encourage you to read it, read it, read it, read it, read it. The book of the Psalms, how many Psalms are there? Somebody tell me. 150. 150 Psalms. The Psalms were the songbook of the Old Testament. The Psalms were the hymnal of the Old Testament people. They would sing these songs during worship whenever they gathered in temple, whenever they gathered in synagogue, and they had their worship service just like you and I are worshiping here today. They would take out that book of songs and they would sing those psalms. That was their hymn book. And so Christ from the cross begins to sing Psalm 22. Note what St. Matthew says. Jesus nailed to the cross, suffering and dying, bloodied and bruised and brutalized, and he cries out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. This isn't the murmured whisper of a dying man. This is a man who is in excruciating pain. Remember that? The word excruciating literally meaning out of the cross. He is suffering. He is dying. And yet he fills his lungs with air and cries out for all to hear, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why would Christ sing this song? I dare say it's an invitation. Just like when I began the sermon, I was hoping somebody else would chime in, especially, uh, uh, apparently we have a lot of shy Lutherans here today. We all should know this because the majority of us grew up with the red hymnal, page 5 and page 15. Could it be that when Christ sang his song from the cross, he was hoping others would join in? That those who were familiar with the Old Testament, that those Jews who had grown up worshiping God every Sabbath day, every Saturday, they would gather together there in temple, there in tabernacle, there in synagogues, and they would sing those psalms, and somebody would say, wait a minute, that's Psalm 22. I know that one. Let's sing along. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What is this man on the cross saying? What is he trying? What message is he trying to share with those gathered around the foot of the cross? Look and see. Look and see. If you've read Psalm 22 like I encouraged you to do, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't read it, read it, and then you'll understand. Think of all the events that are taking place around the cross. The soldiers have nailed Jesus to the cross, and now they are there at the foot of the cross, kneeling, crouched down, casting the knuckles, throwing the knuckles. Remember that? They're throwing dice. They're gambling over the clothes of Jesus Christ. The very thing Psalm 22 talks about, those who are passing by are hurling insults to Jesus Christ. He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let's see if God will rescue him. For he said that he was the Son of God. The very words contained in Psalm 22. And Jesus sings this song as one last invitation 
to believe. All those gathered there at the foot of the cross, all those who are passing by hurling insults at Jesus Christ, he's saying, look and see, I am the Savior, I am the Messiah, I am the one promised in Genesis chapter 3, 15, I am the wounded victor. See and believe and acknowledge and receive the salvation that I am dying for at this very moment. Can you imagine the drama of the scene? Christ nailed to the cross. And St. Matthew tells us that darkness covered the whole land. If you remember your Old Testament, the book of Exodus, the ten plagues that God visited upon the Egyptians to encourage Pharaoh to let God's people go. You know, Charlton Heston, Yul Brenner, the whole nine yards. And one of the plagues, do you remember the ten plagues? One of the plagues was darkness, darkness. And according to the Bible, it was a darkness that could be felt. Have you ever been in a situation to where it is so incredibly dark that you wave your hand in front of your face and you can't even see your hand? Have you ever done that? I have. I was in an old mine up in Colorado, and we walked in, we walked around the corner, and it was so incredibly dark that you literally could r r wiggle your hand in front of your face, and you could not see it. A darkness that could be felt. Noted and noted well, my friends. It's not just a stormy day. This isn't just a weather event. It's not like it's about to rain like we've been having here lately. You know, clouds up, thunder and lightning. Wow, it's a stormy day. I hope this passes over. Give it a few minutes and it'll be gone. In a very real way, good and evil, God and Satan are battling for the possession of our souls. Darkness covers the whole land, says the Bible. And Christ seeing this darkness, realizing the battle, the conflict, the war that is being raged at this very moment, cries out the very first line of Psalm 22 to indicate to all of those standing around, this is what is happening right now. Sin is being paid for. The conflict between good and evil, Satan and God, the war is being waged. Everybody look, take note, pay attention, and believe. Even on the cross, Christ in love reaches out to those who are hurting him, insulting him, belittling him, ridiculing him, rejecting him. The people hear the words, they see the darkness, they look up at the cross, they hear Christ cry out, Eli, Eli, and they misinterpret what is going on. Listen, they say, he's calling for Elijah. Let's see if Elijah will come. And somebody takes a sponge and dri dips it into that pot of pasca, and they stick that sponge on a long stick, and they're going to put it up toward the mouth of Christ. And they say, no, don't do that. Did you realize that? Here's a dying man who has suffered massive blood loss. And he is extremely thirsty, which, by the way, is talked about in Psalm 22. My tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth, says Psalm 22. And whoever this individual is, Matthew does not name or indicate who this person is, but they're going to offer a mercy to Jesus Christ to quench his thirst, and those who are gathered around say, no, stop! Because if you alleviate his pain, Elijah might not come. Malachi the Old Testament book of Malachi, the very last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. I encourage you to read it this afternoon. Malachi 4, 5, or if you're Italian, you would say Malachi. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. 
prophesies that before the Savior comes, Elijah will return to earth. Did this happen? Read Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. I'm not even going to tell you what it's about. Matthew chapter 17. Get into your Bible. Read your Bible. Blow the dust off the scriptures. And read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. Think of what is happening at this point in time in every Jewish household in the world. It's the Passover. And people are getting ready to celebrate the Passover, commemorating when God passed over, the angel of death passed over the land of Egypt and spared all of those who had believed the promise of God and painted the doorpost and the lentil beam with the blood from the lamb that was sacrificed in the Passover meal. And according to Malachi, Elijah would return. And so in every single Jewish household, when the Passover meal is prepared and the Passover table is set, if there's five people that are going to celebrate the Passover, they put out six chairs. If there's seven people, they put out eight chairs. The spare chair is known as the Elijah chair, and they put a cup there and fill it with wine, and that's called the Elijah cup, and they celebrate the Passover. And when the Passover is done, everybody looks into the cup to see if there is still wine there, because if there's no wine, that means Elijah came and drank the wine. They do that to this day. Did you know that? Whenever a Passover meal is celebrated, the Elijah chair and the Elijah cup are set out. That was what was on the mind of the people. It's Passover. And the Passover meal is being prepared. And in every single Jewish household, that Elijah chair had been set out and that Elijah cup had been filled with wine. And now there is this individual on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, who is crying out, Eli, Eli. And they say, listen, he is calling for Elijah. Let's wait and see. if Elijah will come to rescue him and take him down from the cross. Little did they realize Elijah had already come and gone on the Mount of Transfiguration. And had Elijah come, and rescued Jesus, he would have run counter to the will and way of God who had compelled his son to suffer and die for the salvation of mankind. Lord, lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. I would like to think that when my final time comes, that when I'm breathing my last and I'm about to stand before God, that that would be the song that I would sing. And I can sing it with confidence, even though I might not be able to sing very well. But with confidence, I can sing that song because of the song that Christ sang upon the cross of Calvary. Friends and fellow Christians, with that I say, Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in the one true faith, which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.